walked out about five and paid a visit to Countess Montalon. Napoleon remained a few minutes looking at Captain Poppleton, who was busy employed in digging some potatoes out of a little garden that we had endeavored to cultivate in front of the house. The 14th, Napoleon, in a very good humor, told him that a letter had appeared in the French papers, which was attributed to Marquis Montchenu, stating that upon his arrival, he, Napoleon, had given him an invitation to dine to which he had replied that he had been sent to St. Helena to guard and not to dine with him. Ces messieurs sont toujours la même. These gentlemen are always the same, replied the emperor. It is very likely that he has been bet enough to write it. Those old French noblesse are capable of any bêtise folly. He is worthy of being one of the grand naissance high-born of France. Mentioned to him that in one of the papers that had been stated that Sir George Cockburn had gone to Paris impressed with a poor opinion of his, Napoleon's abilities, and had said that on this score of talent, he was an ordinary character and by no means to be feared. Napoleon replied, probably and with reason he does not suppose me to be a god or to be endowed with supernatural talents but i will venture to say that he gives me credit for possessing some if he has really expressed the opinion attributed to him it pays a poor compliment to the discernment of the greatest part of the world he then desired me to get him the paper which contained the report of sir george cockburn's opinion adding that he was now so much accustomed to read libels that he cared but little what was said or what calumnies were published about him the people of england with difficulty will believe added he that i not only read those libels without anger but even laugh at them from the violence of temper which has been attributed to me i suppose they think i must be worked up by rage to fits of madness they are mistaken they only excite my laughter la verite still bless the truth alone wounds I asked him about the affair of Palm and said I had been informed that he had given a satisfactory explanation of every sanguinary act that he had been accused of having committed except that. Napoleon replied, I have never been asked any explanation about it. All that I recollect is that Palm was arrested by the order of Davu, I believe, tried, condemned, and shot for having, while the country was in possession of the French and under military occupation, not only excited rebellion amongst the inhabitants and urged them to rise and massacre the soldiers, but also attempted to instigate the soldiers themselves to refuse obedience to their orders and a mutiny against the generals. I believe that he met with a fair trial. I should like continued he to read the principal libels which have been published against me in England. If I could get them in French, dearest Peltier, added he laughing, who proves that I was myself the contriver of the infernal machine. Major Hodson paid a visit to Countess Bertrand, informed her that both himself and his wife would be most happy to call frequently upon her, but that insinuations had been made to him that it would not be liked at Plantation House. 15th, Sir Hudson Lowe gave directions to Captain Poppleton that General Bonaparte or any of his suite might go unaccompanied along the road to Woody Ridge and to Miss Mason's, but that they were not permitted to quit the path, and that they might re-enter Longwood at the bottom of the wood, that the two sentinels at the end of the wood were still to remain. He then asked what were the orders of those sentinels. Captain Poppleton replied to let no person in or out of Longwood. Sir Hudson desired that those orders should still be continued in force, adding that he did not think that the path by which the French were to be permitted to enter was near enough to the sentinels to allow them to interfere with them. He desired also that the sentinels should be posted a little before sunset. Cipriani in town making the usual purchases of provisions. 16th, so the emperor in the drawing room. He was in extremely good spirits. Laughed repeatedly, joked with me on a supposed attachment to a fair damsel and endeavored to speak some English. 
said that he had seen Lady Bangham the day before, but that she could not speak French, that she looked good-tempered. Bertrand said, Napoleon has told me that the governor has at last sent up his answers. They are full of imbecility. I have not read them myself, but from what Bertrand tells me, they are a very poor production and would make one pity the writer who covers over so many pages without arriving at any conclusion. He asserts that he never has signed a pass for one day only when the fact is that numbers of persons have shown the pass is signed by him to Bertrand and pointed out to him that the day was specifically marked and consequently begged of him to interest himself to induce me to see them on that day as they could not enter Longwood upon any other. C. Five Pieta de Louis. Napoleon then spoke at length about Talleyrand. The triumph of Talleyrand said he is the triumph of immorality a priest united to another man's wife and who has paid her husband a large sum of money to leave her with him a man who has sold everything betrayed everybody and every side i forbade madame talleyrand the court first because she was a disreputable character. And because I found out that some Genoese merchants had paid her 400,000 francs in order to gain some commercial favors by means of her husband, she was a very fine woman, English or East Indian, but sought foolish and grossly ignorant. I sometimes ask to know whose works I suppose you have read to breakfast with me as I took a pleasure in his conversation and conversed very freely with him. Now all the intriguers and speculators paid their court to Denon with the view of inducing him to mention their projects for themselves in the course of his conversations with me, thinking that even being mentioned by such a man as Denon, for whom I had a great esteem, might materially serve them. Talleyrand, who was a great speculator, invited Dinon to dinner. When he went home to his wife, he said, My dear, I have invited Dinon to dine. He is a great traveler, and you must say something handsome to him about his travels, as he may be useful to us with the emperor. His wife, being extremely ignorant and probably never having read any other book of travels than that of Robinson Crusoe, concluded that Dinon could be nobody else than Robinson. Wishing to be very civil to him, she, before a large company, asked him diverse questions about his Mid Friday. Dinon, astonished, did not know what to think at first, but it, like, discovered by her questions. Did she really imagine him to be Robinson Crusoe? His astonishment and that of the company cannot be described, nor the peals of laughter which had excited in Paris as the story flew like wildfire through the city, and even Talleyrand himself was ashamed of it. The doctor has said, continued he, that I'd turn Mahometan in Egypt. Now, it is not the case. I never followed any of the tenets of that religion. I never prayed in the mosques. I never abstained from wine or was circumcised. Never did I ever profess it. I said merely that we were the friends of the Muslim men. And that I respected Muhammad, their prophet, which was true. I respect him now. I wanted to make the immense caused prayers to be offered up in the mosques for me in order to make the people respect me still more than they actually did and obey me more readily. The imams replied that there was a great obstacle because their prophet in the Quran had inculcated them that they were not to obey, respect, or hold faith with the infidels and that I came under that denomination. I then desired them to hold the consultation and see what was necessary to be done in order to become a Muslim as some other tenets could not be practiced by us. That as to circumcision, God had made us unfit for that. That with respect to drinking wine, we were 
poor cold people, inhabitants of the north who could not exist without it, therefore that we could neither circumcise nor abstain from wine. They consulted together accordingly, and in about three weeks issued a fathom, declaring that circumcision might be omitted because it was merely a profession that as to drinking wine, it might be drunk by Muslim men, but that those who drank it would not go to paradise but to hell. I replied that this would not do, that we had no occasion to make ourselves Muslim men in order to go to hell, that there were many ways of getting there without coming to Egypt, and desired them to hold another consultation. Well, after deliberating and battling together for I believe three months, they finally decided that a man might become a Muslim man and neither circumcised nor abstain from wine, but that in proportion to the wine drunk, some good works must be done. I then told them that we were all Muslim men and friends of the Prophet, which they readily believed, as the French soldiers never went to church and had no priest with them. For you must know that during the revolution, there was no revolution, religion, whatever, in the French army. Men who continued Napoleon really turned Muslim, which was the reason that I left him behind. He then spoke about some of the plans that he had had in contemplation for making canals of communication in Egypt. I intended, said he, to have made two, one from the Red Sea to the Nile at Cairo and the other to the Mediterranean. I had the Red Sea surveyed and found that the waters of it were 30 feet higher than the Mediterranean when the waters were highest, but only 24 at the lowest. My plan was to have prevented any water from flowing into the canal unless at low water and this in the course of a distance of 30 leagues in its passage to the Mediterranean would have been of little consequence. Besides, I would have had some sluices made. The Nile was seven feet lower than the Red Sea when at its lowest, but 14 feet higher. I think he said during the inundation, the expense was calculated at 18 millions of francs in two years' labor. It is only continued he the ignorance and barbarity of the Turks, which prevents your India trade from being ruined. When, if any European nation had possession of Egypt, it would speedily be affected, and one day or another, Egypt will destroy the East India Company. If Cliver had lived, you would never have conquered it. He would have had the army down from Cairo nine days and would have overwhelmed you. If I had been there myself, I would have brought the troops down in seven days and have been on the coast before you had disembarked. I had done so before, when the Turks landed with Sir Sidney Smith. 